The events in this program are based on a true story. Names, dates, and details have been changed. Coming up on Bizarre Murders, a 15-year-old boy disappears without a trace. Two years later, he surprisingly re-emerges in another country. But upon his return, things just don't seem the same. <laughs> Thomas Gaines, a troubled kid from a troubled home. At just age 15, he already has three tattoos, one of which is a cross made of bones on his left hand. Thomas has developed a bad reputation around town for being physically and verbally abusive with his own mother, Janice Gaines. Give me the mirror. What? That's my mother's mirror. Oh, no, she's not in much mirror. better shape herself. Janice is a single mother who works the graveyard shift at the local donut shop. And she's developed a terrible addiction to heroin. And some would say an even worse addiction to sweets. Janice's favorite activity is snoring her days away, which is fine with Thomas. It gives him and his much older siblings, Kimberly and Craig, ample opportunity to behave badly. Thomas was recently arrested for shoplifting computers, a felony. Computers. He's on the verge of being sentenced to juvenile detention. On a hot summer day in 2008, looking for distraction, Thomas steals $5 from his mother's purse. He grabs his wallet and backpack and heads out the door to play basketball at a local park with his friends. As night falls and the game wraps up, he calls home to ask for a ride. But as always, his mother is fast asleep. Annoyed, his older brother Craig tells him to just walk home instead. This is the very last time anybody will ever speak to Thomas Gaines. One quiet summer night, he disappears into thin air, and he's never heard from again. When a teen is reported missing, especially when there's a history of drug addiction or abuse or conflict in the home, it is almost always treated as a runaway. And in almost all of those cases, the kids are found and brought home within 72 hours, or not at all. The clock is ticking on Thomas Gaines. The circumstances lead authorities to believe that Thomas ran away for any number of reasons. But as their critical 72-hour window closes, the police begin to worry that they won't find Thomas Gaines anytime soon. So here's the quandary the police have. Did something really bad happen to this kid, or did he take foot bail because he was afraid of going to juvie? Now the police have to start looking at different options, and they have to do it right away because 10% of these kids who go missing don't do it voluntarily. In Thomas Gaines' case, the vital hours turn into days, and then weeks, and then very quickly, three months pass without a single clue as to the boy's whereabouts. Then, one night, the cops receive an urgent phone call. Thomas's older brother, Craig, is on the other end of the line. He says he sees his little brother outside the house trying to break into the family's garage. The police race to the scene. They search the Gaines garage and the rest of the property. There's not a single sign of a break-in at the house. The cops question Craig and begin to wonder if he made up the story, and if so, why? People make up stories to tell the police all the time. You wonder, is it for fun? Did they somehow misinterpret something they saw or the facts as they were told? Or sometimes it might just be a cry for help. Two years after the disappearance of 15-year-old Thomas Gaines, cops receive a call from a police station in Italy. 
The man on the other end of the line says that a young man in their care recently escaped a European drug trafficking ring where he was forced to traffic narcotics. The young man claims he was kidnapped two years earlier from Pomona, California. His name is Thomas Gaines. The police are stunned. Mm -hmm. The Italian yeah, caller right. lets them know that although visibly traumatized, Thomas seems to be in good condition. He's even learned to speak bits and pieces of several languages, including French. Now this is unbelievable. I mean, the odds of being found alive after being gone for two years has got to be somewhere like one in 10 million. You have a greater chance of being eaten by an alligator than you do of being found alive after being held captive for so long. Hi, Hi. Miss Gaines. Yeah. Investigators arrive at Janice's door and inform her of the good news. Her long lost son, Thomas, may have been found alive in Italy. Authorities need a family member to fly over to Europe to confirm his identity. The Gaines are in complete and utter shock. Finally, they have some of the answers to his disappearance and are thrilled he is alive. But Craig is uncharacteristically quiet, taking in all the news. They found Tommy. <sighs> he seems shell-shocked at the news. A local church raises the money to pay for Kimberly, Thomas's older sister, to fly to Italy. Kimberly is known as the good Gaines. She is kind, sweet, and a little naive. She's never traveled outside California before, let alone the United States. But she is really looking forward to positively identifying her little brother and ending her family's two-year nightmare. Since Thomas's disappearance, her mother and brother have changed dramatically for the better. Janice has a new job as a bookkeeper, and Craig has just graduated from community college. In situations where a teenager was abducted, there's a lot of trauma for the family of the victim that were left behind. Everybody needs to adapt back into the family and into the family's routine especially the victim. But this is hard because they're all changed people. Kimberly anxiously arrives at the police station. She's holding a stack of family photos. In another room, sitting quietly, is an older looking teen, almost a man. Kimberly looks through a window at him. Could this young man in the corner of a foreign country 8,000 miles away from home really be her long-lost little brother? Thomas Gaines, a troubled 15-year-old kid, steals money from his mom and goes to play basketball, never to be heard from again. Two years later, Pomona police receive a strange call from a police station in Italy that a young man in their care claims he was kidnapped two years earlier from Pomona, California, and that his name is Thomas Gaines. Investigators inform the Gaines family and Thomas's sister, Kimberly, flies to Italy to identify him and bring him home. Police Station, Naples, Italy, 2010. Kimberly Gaines, with family photos in hand, enters a small room in which a teenager is sitting quietly. He quickly stands in disbelief. As he embraces her, she recognizes him immediately. On his left hand is his telltale cross tattoo. She quickly confirms to the authorities that this is her long lost little brother. But authorities tell her not to expect much from Thomas right away. They say he may have been severely abused while in captivity and seems to have very few memories of his life before being abducted. He also speaks with a French accent. In situations like this, the abductors want autonomous victims. They don't want somebody that they're gonna have to lock into a room or always wonder if they're gonna try to escape. So what they do is they brainwash them. They tell them that drug dealing is the most normal thing in the world to be doing. And besides, your family doesn't want you back anyway. Satisfied, authorities release him. You're coming home. 
and the two of them head to the American consulate, where Thomas is issued a new U.S. passport. When Thomas and Kimberly arrive in California, they're greeted by a small family celebration and accompanied by some investigators. Hi. Thomas's mother, Janice, stands back surveying the scene. Kimberly pushes her towards Thomas. Janice looks at him in the eyes for a long time and then gives him a hug. Thomas looks around and realizes one person is missing, his brother Craig. He asks her where his older brother is, but she tells him he couldn't make it. Craig has just graduated from community college, but then checked himself into a drug treatment program. While the Gaines are overjoyed to have Thomas home, little things about him seem quite strange to them. Thomas's eyes have changed color he always had bright blue eyes, but now they are a very somber, dark shade of brown. Also, his complexion is much darker and more olive. Thomas surprisingly opens up with his family some of the horrors of his captivity. They used chemicals on him to change his skin and complexion and the color of his eyes, so he would no longer be recognizable. The Gaines are rightfully horrified and want Thomas to get back to as normal a life as possible. Janice now lives in a very small studio apartment, so Thomas moves in with Kimberly and her husband in their trailer about 20 miles outside of town. Yeah, this is, uh, this is it. Yeah. He sleeps on a mattress on the floor. He quickly enrolls in the local high school as a senior. That's a much more rural life than where Thomas used to live in Pomona. Family thinks it's good for him to be around new schoolmates who don't know him from before and won't judge what he's been through. This is the story of a child who's been kidnapped, then he transported to Europe by a drug trafficking ring, and then who manages to escape. It's the stuff of books and bad direct-to-DVD movies. A tabloid news program gets wind of Thomas's story and hires a local PI, Ron Dyson, to dig deeper into the story. Hello? Dyson shows up at Kimberly's trailer with a TV crew looking for Thomas. Thomas here? No. Kimberly asks them to leave, but Thomas walks out and volunteers to be interviewed. Dyson is stunned by the boy's thick accent and his broken English. Dyson compares a picture of 15-year-old Thomas with the 17-year-old teen before him and thinks something isn't right. After hearing Thomas's harrowing tale about how his eye color has been permanently altered, Dyson contacts several top ophthalmologists to ask if eye colors can be changed by injecting them with chemicals. They all tell him no. You can change your eye color with contacts, yeah. But with chemicals and eye drops, not so much. Dyson contacts a dialect expert to see if a person's accent could change so dramatically and if they would forget their native language after two years. Again, the answer is no. I mean, they might pick up an accent, maybe even new ways of phrasing their sentences, but they're not gonna forget their native language. Dyson takes his suspicions to the Pomona police, but they are distracted by another case, a possible murder. Thomas Gaines, a troubled 15-year-old kid from Pomona, California, suddenly disappears without a trace. Two years later, the police receive a strange call from the authorities in Italy. They say a young man named Thomas Gaines is in their care. His eyes are a different color, and he has a thick French accent. Thomas and his family try to resume a normal life, but a local private investigator, Ron Dyson, starts digging into his story, senses something is wrong, and contacts the Pomona police. Meanwhile, construction workers building a new subdivision in Pomona have unearthed the skeletal remains of a preteen boy. Found along with his bones are a t-shirt and basketball shorts a dirt-stained backpack, and the wallet of a 15-year-old Thomas Gaines. 
Homicide detectives are concerned. They send the bones away for DNA testing. If the bones are Thomas Gaines, then who is the young man living with them? If the bones are not Thomas's, then whose are they? Authorities decide they must get DNA from Thomas Gaines. They visit the trailer and invite Thomas to come to the station with them to answer questions about his captors. Okay. okay go ahead. Thomas obliges, and while at the station, they have him take a DNA test and fingerprints. Yeah. You know they didn't fingerprint him? I mean, really? <laughs> That's the first thing you do. It is crucial to find out things like, who is this guy? The police run his fingerprints through the FBI database in Interpol. They get a hit, but they're stunned with the results. The person claiming to be Thomas Gaines is actually a French national by the name of Jacques Gobert. He's known to law enforcement agencies in Europe as an impersonator of missing children. He even has a nickname, the Changeling. Each time Jacques was exposed as an imposter, he would casually admit to his crime and move on in the dead of night to a new town and start again. Pomona Police Department, 2010. Pomona Police press Jacques for details on how he ended up impersonating Thomas Gaines. Jacques says, I'm not a bad person. I just want to be loved. I just want a family of my very own for once. He happily admits that he was living in a youth shelter in Italy, but he was on the verge of being discovered. So he decided to steal the name and identity of a real person this time, an American. So it would be harder for Italian authorities to confirm. At night, he snuck into the shelter's office and called the US Center for Missing and Exploited Children, disguised as one of the employees Jacques basically describes himself to the woman on the phone, and she checks her databases and finds that this kid bears a strong resemblance to a kid who went missing out of Pomona two years before. And so what if the eye color doesn't match? Everything else was so close. The U.S. Center for Missing and Exploited Children quickly emails Jacques a picture of Thomas Gaines on the shelter's computer. He thinks he closely resembles the American boy and can easily pass as him. Gobert confirms that the missing teen is at the shelter standing in front of them. Now the con is on for Jacques. He studies the picture and finds this tattoo on the kid's hands. Next stop, the tattoo parlor, where this genius gets the exact tattoo on his hand, right about there. Final stop, the Naples Police Department. And that's how it happened. But now the Pomona police aren't just looking at Jacques as an imposter, they're looking at him as a murder suspect. Police arrest Gobert on another charge, forgery. At this point, there's more questions than answers. And two of those questions are, number one, what happened to Thomas Gaines? And number two, why are the Gaines family playing along with the charade that Jacques is Thomas. When police get the DNA back from the bones, it's a match for Thomas Gaines. They begin to interrogate Jacques. He doubles down on his story of impersonating the boy, but says he had nothing to do with the boy's actual disappearance. But he says the only family member who avoids him is Thomas's older brother, Craig. He tells the police he thinks Thomas's brother had always known he was an imposter, but he's not sure why. Jacques Gobert is a con man in his early 20s from France. He has duped a long-suffering family and authorities from two different countries into believing that he's Thomas Gaines from Pomona, California. But three months after Gobert moved to Pomona, the real Thomas Gaines remains were unearthed by a construction crew. Jacques breaks down and admits he is an imposter, but has no idea who killed the real Thomas Gaines. Pomona detectives inform Janice Gaines about the discovery of her son's remains and the identity of the young man who had claimed to be Thomas Gaines. Janice is stunned and tearful. She says that she began to suspect the young man was not her son 
but she so badly wanted to believe it. Craig is less emotional, but he denies knowing anything about his brother's disappearance. A few days later, the police visit Craig in his apartment to question him again, but they find him dead of a drug overdose, which they rule a suicide. Janice breaks down when police tell her the news about Craig. She knows why Craig killed himself. Two years ago, after Thomas disappeared, Craig admitted to his mother that he killed Thomas, choking him in a drug-induced rage. He buried Thomas's body in the woods, close to their house. Janice probably kept Craig's secret all these years because of her own guilt, shame, and to protect the one son she still had left. Janice Gaines is found guilty of accessory to murder and goes to prison for 10 years. Meanwhile, Jacques Gobert pleads guilty to perjury and possessing and obtaining official documents under false pretenses for his callous and thoughtless impersonation of a missing boy. Jacques is sentenced to six years. This is a case with multiple tragic endings. It's the story of a family who loses a child only to have him resurface years later and then to lose him again to the most unimaginable circumstances. On the other hand, a man who just wished he had a family to love him went to great lengths to make that happen. And for a little while, maybe it was healing for both of them.